Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Robin Mockenhaupt. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with Virginia Funders Network, and we're delighted to see you here this afternoon for this uh, first of three sessions on affordable housing um, through a very generous grant from Virginia Housing. We are very excited about being able to offer this first session today. Um, and so, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everyone. Uh, this is an important topic for everyone in the Commonwealth, no matter what part of the state you live in. Affordable housing is an important issue, and we're all looking for solutions and ways that uh, we can address it in our communities. So welcome. We're really pleased that so many people signed up for this session today. So I have the pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. And um, she asked that I just give her name and where she works. But I have to tell you, um, I am delighted that we have such an expert with such an incredible background on housing to lead us through this session today. So I'd love for, to introduce you to Dr. Monique Johnson, who serves as the Managing Director of Community Outreach at uh, Virginia Housing. And as I mentioned, Virginia Housing is sponsoring not only today's session, but all of our three sessions over the course of this next year. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, at Virginia Housing, Monique uh, is really responsible for looking at community housing, and she will tell you more about it and what she does there. But in the meantime, let me turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome again. Um, I'm not going to bore you all with my bio. Um, but my goal is to just provide you with some insight to set the stage for what I think will be a really important conversation about affordable housing and some of the needs across the Commonwealth and some of the kind of more progressive actions that uh, we're seeing partners take and how you can potentially um, also make a difference in this important work. So before I begin, though, I just wanted to level set so in case there are individuals that don't know who Virginia Housing is. Uh, and so Virginia Housing is the state's housing finance agency. We've been around for, uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Um, and so we were created with a really specific mission and that is to help every Virginian attain quality affordable housing. And so we have done that you know, primarily through supporting the um, financing of affordable rental units and also through uh, originating home loans for first time home buyers. Um, but we also, just given our unique structure, we're a, a quasi state agency, so we don't receive any taxpayer dollars, um, but of course we are guided by our mission. So um, the that also then allows us to generate funds and then we use, we can be pretty creative about how we reinvest those funds into our mission. And so, um, you know, I'd say that to highlight the fact that last year we created a grant program that was specifically for public housing authorities and that allowed us to provide $46 million across 25 housing authorities in Virginia to help support public housing transformation. Uh, and so what we really try to do is make sure we understand where the needs are, how we can support um, with our financing, our grants, and then just some of the other technical expertise that we have in-house as well. And so um, I have worked in the affordable housing and community development world for about 20 years. Um, and I've worked in various capacities from the lending side to the housing development side, um, and also kind of in the academic world, um, just to kind of raise up our next generation of leaders in this space. Um, and one thing that I always find is that there is just a lot of um, just uncertainty about what we mean when we say affordable housing. Uh, and so I'd like to show this slide just so folks understand the fact that um, there is a spectrum of need that we are trying to address in this space. Um, and so we have partners who are kind of dealing with the most critical emergency housing needs and addressing homelessness um, and through emergency shelter provision. 
And then we have partners like, I'm not sure if you all have heard, Virginia Supportive Housing, who have a permanent supportive mo housing model that are helping individuals transition um, into more safe, stable housing through public housing, affordable rental, which uses me a mechanism that is called the low income housing tax credit. And oftentimes our financing supports to you know, the spectrum of home ownership as well. So um, we find that there are different partners who are operating in these individual spaces. Uh, and one thing I want to highlight is the fact that you know all every type of housing on this continuum comes with a different level of complexity. And so we find that as a funder, we have to really understand what the needs are along the spectrum and, and figure out how our resources can kind of be brought to bear to support that. Um, one model, one example that I like to highlight on as we talk about transitional housing, for example, uh, a partner that we work pretty closely with, Virginia Supportive Housing, um, recently developed a community uh, he, in the Richmond metropolitan area uh, that cost it several million dollars, probably about 15 to 20 million dollars. And they had to secure funding from 30 different funding sources in order to absorb those costs. So the complexity of putting these deals together and identifying different sources of funds is very real. But what we are also finding is that there's a growing gap when it comes to the need for supporting the services that come along with the, the units. And uh, just to give you a sense of this, the scale of the need. So across Virginia, there's a shortage and that shortage has become even more acute over the past few years. And it's particularly problematic for extremely low income households. And those are households whose incomes are um, uh, 30 percent, uh, whose incomes are at or below 30 percent of the area median income. And so what we do in our world is we think about how burdened households are when it comes to trying to meet their housing needs. Um, and so we talk about households being extremely or severely housing cost burdened if they're having to spend 50% or more of their income on housing. Um, and so this particular graphic, I think, kind of shows um, uh, what the need is and what the gap is as well. So this shows 2021 ACS data, and it says that 24% of renter households were extremely low income, and that meant they were making um, $30,000 or so a year. Uh, and at that time, um, an annual household income of about 55000 was needed to support um, the rent for a two-bedroom unit. Um, and that actually has increased over time. So, you know, at that particular time, it meant that those extremely low income households were um, severely cost burdened or 78% of those households were extremely cost burdened. Um, and so, you know, for in my world, we recognize that um, as we're trying to kind of address the housing needs, um, it's those households that are severely cost burdened that are then more likely to sacrifice, you know, other necessities re related to, uh, you know, food or healthier food options. They kind of sacrifice when it comes to health care and being able to pay. It's either, you know, do you pay your health care costs or your medication or your rent um, and are more likely to experience housing instability. So um, we are all at Virginia Housing in particular very much focused on, you know, how do we meet the the needs of those extremely low-income households, which are the most difficult to meet, but um, are also very critical. And then this is just to give you a sense by geography where some of those gaps are. So it's probably not surprising, but the uh, Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, Central Virginia have the greatest unmet need. And so that's considered to be the urban crescent. Uh, however, we recognize that there are housing challenges across the state, um, even though they look different. Uh, so, for example, in our rural communities, there's definitely a gap between the need and the supply of units available. But the unique challenges faced in our rural communities have to do with the infrastructure and whether or not infrastructure is available to support the development of units um, because the cost of um, 
putting in infrastructure is pretty significant and also developer capacity. We find that there aren't as many developers within those communities who have the capacity to build units um, and provide for that, that neighborhood. And then finally, just wanted to kind of give you all a sense of, of some of what's going on as we continuously navigate some of these challenges. Um, we at Virginia Housing and a lot of our other partners who provide different types of funding are trying to constantly evaluate the programs that we offer to make sure that they're meeting the changing needs um, and, and try to make them not as difficult to navigate so that our partners can gain access to resources. And again, we also have the flexibility to create programs and services in order to address needs. And a big part of what we try to do is, is um, understand what our stakeholders um, or get stakeholder input so we understand where and how we can direct our resources. Um, there's advocacy around new programs. We find that there is a, a heightened interest in ensuring that there's more rental assistance available for households in addition to producing more units. Uh, and then a focus on trying to reduce to reduce other costs as to minimize the burden that some of these families have to carry, um, one of which is utility costs. And then finally, and I'm sure Erica will discuss this as well, but there is a heightened focus on zoning um, to, to try and encourage jurisdictions um, to allow for multifamily housing um, projects and because we, we do find or have found across the state that some communities are more receptive to that than others. Um, and if we can't build enough units, then we kind of continue to grapple with some of these same challenges. So I am very excited about today's conversation. And so I really hope that the conversation leaves you with some pretty meaningful insight. Um, I also am hoping that we all kind of take this opportunity to share and engage with both the speakers and the panelists. Um, I'm going to be checking the chat, so uh, please feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat along the way, and I'll use your questions to facilitate discussion with our panelists. And so with that, I am going to introduce uh, Erica. Um, Erica, I'm so Erica Sims. Erica and I know each other, so I, I just had a a, a brain. Um, <laughs> I just I was like, Erica, what's your last name? <laughs> so used to us just you know being on a first name basis. But Erica Sims is is a partner, definitely of Virginia Housing, um, and we respect the work that Housing for Virginia does to just advocate for some of the changes that need to be made in the affordable housing space. Um, and so I'm looking forward to Erica sharing with us some insight into the current environment um, and data and just some opportunities potentially that can be explored in order to address some of these challenges. Thank you, Monique. Uh, so yes, I was asked today to talk a little bit about the current state of affordable housing in Virginia um, and then highlight barriers and opportunities, particularly opportunities um, as I think about them um, in the context of your work. Um, and so I'm going to um, just share with you some slides initially about our organization and um, some of some current data. Um, and, you know, I chose a data that I think is most interesting to me uh, lately, but, um, you know, there's a lot of data out there. That is uh, what Housing Forward Virginia does um, it, as its bread and butter. We're a statewide uh, housing policy organization, a nonprofit that really is here to serve you and provide you with actionable data that you can use in your community to understand housing need and also housing policy. So this map here shows a little bit of where we've been lately doing very targeted work in helping um, localities to develop new programs or to analyze um, market conditions. And so we do a lot of events, research, um, and communications on affordable housing. Um, and so, you know, our goal is really to um, inform the public, to support regional housing efforts, to provide leaders with actionable information, to 
highlight the racial disparities that are inherent in housing production and housing markets and to be a positive image for affordable housing and help further that positive image for affordable housing. And on the right of this screen are some of our free resources that we have. Um, I want to point out in particular the third bullet, which is House Bill 854, um, which is a study that we can conducted for the, the state legislature and completed that back in 2022. Um, and so um, that's a com comprehensive analysis of the state's affordable housing needs and um, all of the programs that the state currently operates to address affordable housing, whether that's homeless to home ownership. Um, and then we were also asked by the state to evaluate four potential state level programs, for example, a state run rental voucher similar to the Section 8 voucher. And so um, you'll, these slides will be shared with you later and you can uh, head to that link. Um, and the recent, recent uh, legislative session um, approved the state to continue to do regular um, updates, um, housing study updates. And so it's still to be determined how they will um, implement that and when that will begin. But that's really a best practice across other states is really to just benchmark yourself and understand where are we now, where are we headed, where do we need to go when it comes to um, affordable housing production. Um, so these are some really helpful resources that I would encourage you to um, look at after the uh, summit today. Uh, some of these were not developed by us, some of them were, um, but these are things that we read and learn a lot about current the current conditions of affordable housing. So the first thing I always think about is wages, because that is really fundamental to why we are here today. And the picture is not great. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these slides, but um, middle class jobs are harder and harder to come by in Virginia. And as you see new um, economic development initiatives happening around the state, often the wages that are coming with those uh, new initiatives are not sufficient to pay the cost to build new housing. Um, and so uh, wages is definitely the fundamental uh, constraint on us being able to affordably house folks. There are technically enough units in, by a very small margin in Virginia to house all Virginians. Um, so it's much more about the cost of those units. Um, and uh, right now uh, they are out of reach for a lot of people. Um, this is a, a chart that kind of shows you um, the growth of more and more expensive units. So on the X axis here, you have the cost of units um, and these are units to rent in this slide. Um, and so from the left hand side um, to the right hand side, you get progressively more and more uh, high rents. Um, and you can see that the bars on the right side of the, each of these three charts um, are the ones that are very high. So high rent units are the ones that are exploding in growth. And this is looking at large, small, and rural area, large metro, small metro, and rural areas. So this is consistent throughout um, all of our housing markets. And when you look at the percent change in rent over the last 10 or so years, you have a 43% change in median rent for the state. Um, and you know, I know that we are going through a period of a year or two of unusually high inflation um, preceded by a period of very, very low inflation, but nothing, nowhere near 43% over a 10 year period for any good or service that you can imagine. Housing is an extreme outlier and a huge driver of inflation. And this statistic shows you um, who, how could anyone, any of us absorb a 43% increase in an essential component to, to our lives like this. So just to summarize, um, these, this is what I think about when I think about the um, 
rental market. Wages are not going up. There's a low supply of apartments. Localities are behind on encouraging and, and permitting apartments. That is zoning, that is um, the public approval process, that is NIMBYism, all of these things that kind of slow down the production uh, and the creation of housing. And um, over a longer period of time, since the 1970s, there has been a significant decrease in the in the amount of federal support for housing production and housing subsidies, rental subsidies. And so you see that burden being shifted to states and local governments as the federal government has receded from the picture of housing policy. But I have this but here because that is really changing. We are really seeing that shift um, happening again because of how acute the problem is. And so I'll talk a little bit about that further about the federal level um, uh, situation um, and what that means for us. So now I just want to kind of do the same thing I did with rental for a few slides around home ownership. Not a pretty picture on this side either, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so state median home price now in 2023 is $400,000 for the state. Racial and ethnic disparities in home ownership are at some of their worst levels um, since the uh, uh, since this started being um, tracked by the federal government in the 1960s. And today the average home sale is out of reach for the average renter in every single locality in Virginia. So what do I think about here? Um, very low supply compared to demand, both in high and low interest rate environments, supply is constrained. It's been a very interesting experience, very interesting market we've lived through in the last few years to see the pain of that very heated market that sort of ended during the intense period of COVID where you had continued low interest rates and you had this intense housing market, intense uh, supply constraints, and then you very rapidly shifted to a high interest rate environment and the supply constraint um, was only exacerbated. And so, um, you know, that is not how it has worked in housing um, cycles in the past. Um, in housing cycles in the past, the, in those different high and low interest rate environments, supply has been able to um, move more freely, to grow more freely, um, and that just hasn't happened for us. So it's um, interesting to be able to be around in a time when you can see interest rates change so quickly and see supply stay so constant. And so, um, again, localities are not um, zoning for denser, less expensive homes. The vast majority of our zoning in the state is uh, single family zoning. So, um, I like to refer to housing as what's called in like the public policy theory as a super wicked problem. Um, and a super wicked problem, if you've heard of them, is a societal problem that has a few characteristics in common. And the most common one that people refer to is climate change. Um, but I believe affordable housing is a super wicked problem too. And some of the characteristics that really resonate with me are that the solutions aren't true or false for fixing affordable housing. They're just better or worse. Um, and that there's no opportunity to learn um, and experiment except through doing it and affecting, making really a big effects on either the problem itself or the people that are involved. Um, and so the stakes are very high as you attempt to find solutions. Um, and that every wicked problem can be considered a symptom of another problem. Um, and but to my mind, affordable housing is imminently easier to solve than climate change. So we should all take a deep breath that we're here <laughs> on this call and not on whatever webinar um, is happening right now trying to solve uh, climate change. Because there are known solutions. Um, Monique brought one up that is, um, you know, highlighted again and again, permanent support of housing for uh, homeless um, individuals, incredibly high success rates, very successful, um, very proven. Um, 
has a cost to it. And so that is really what we are talking about is the cost associated with doing this work. And I understand, I'm, I'm fully aware that um, philanthropy, um, and those of you on the call do not have the financial resources that are sufficient enough to address this problem. This problem requires a magnitude much larger. And that is really a federal government level solution. Um, and as I said before, there is a lot um, of writing on the wall that that is um, changing. It's also a state level solution, right? We've seen a significant increase in state level resources. Um, and I was just on a call before this um, this uh, this webinar uh, that was about the neighborhood homes tax credit and the folks at the federal level who are have been advocating for that for years are just giddy that it may actually pass this next um, legislative session at the federal level. And that is a tax credit program for affordable home ownership. Um, so it is a companion tax credit to the low income housing tax credit, which I'm sure all of you have um, heard of before. And this would be just a massive game changer. It would be, um, according to the information they were sharing, $60 million a year in new funding for affordable home ownership for Virginia, um, uh, based on the calculations that they had in their budget. Um, so there are these level of solutions on the horizon. It is what keeps me optimistic. Um, and so how can those of us who are um, trying to do good in the meantime, or trying to make that happen, how can we be a part of that? And I think that these two things on the left hand side of the screen are where I land when I think about solutions that we all need to take up in the interim as we wait for those federal resources to be unleashed. Um, and one is um, our organizational capacity. So that is capacity building in particular for nonprofits. So, you know, we saw this really uh, clearly during COVID when there was significant amounts of affordable housing funding. Um, it also went to our state um, agencies, um, significant affordable, ho affordable housing funding had to be um, dispersed by them. And everyone did an amazing job in a very short period of time, scaling up massively and then scaling back down massively um, and, 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 and surviving that. Um, and so I think that that's a great example that we can do this um, and we need to be planning and preparing for that um, because the nonprofit sector has a limited number of um, high, uh, high performing producers. Um, and then the second issue is that local land use policy needs to change. Um, and if you've heard me talk in the last month or so, you've probably heard me talk about Montana, which I never visited, but has now become my favorite place in the country. Um, they uh, passed an omnibus bill this last legislative session at the state uh, level and just completely changed zoning and for affordable housing in that state. That state is the 47th least dense state in the in the in the country. Um, so it is a predominantly rural state and it is a Republican supermajority. And three years ago, similar legislation was put forward by Democrats and it was dead dead on arrival so that says to me things can change on a dime there is bipartisanship that can happen um and no matter your uh no matter your conditions your your geographic conditions whether you're rural whether you're urban you, this is this can be something that you can do um though but that is coalition building that is um you know, really significant advocacy work um, that has to happen at um, the state level to make those kind of changes. And those changes were very controversial. If any of you on the call are involved in local government on a board of supervisors, local governments are very concerned about states around the country that have started to um, enforce these state level rules on uh, how dense you can build in particular affordable housing with, with a good, reason, right? You don't want local control about what you can build where to be taken away by the state. But that also means that funders have an opportunity to go to local governments and to say, this trains are coming. <laughs> 
why don't you do it yourself? Why don't you spend some money? We will give you the money to do the analysis, to build the community well, to um, get the good plans in place so that you are not being pushed into um, upzoning your locality, but you're getting the control of, and being able to do it. Um, and so those are really two things that um, I would really encourage uh, folks on this call to be thinking about um, as they um, consider uh, funding uh, and supporting affordable housing. So in summary, um, things will get worse without intervention. Um, there are opportunities in today's housing market um, and um, providers need operational capacity and support to be able to seize those opportunities. We need to take advantage of the amount of conversation that is happening around housing in economic development spheres, in healthcare, in government. It's a, it's, it's becoming such an acute problem that it is the awareness of it is at a high watermark, as is the funding. Um, and localities can um, really play a key role in um, opening up their jurisdictions for affordable housing. So I'm, I talked a lot about how Housing Forward Virginia spends a lot of time doing data analysis, and I'd be happy to share with you after this call if we've done specific uh, data analysis in your jurisdiction. We've done a lot of very granular analysis, and we're, uh, we're happy to share that. Um, and if we haven't done it, probably someone else has, and we can direct you to that. We also are now spending a lot of time with localities thinking about housing solutions and implementation. Um, and so I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but um, there are a lot of solutions out there, and there's a whole menu and array of things that um, places are trying. We are helping right now the New River Valley and region to uh, set up the first regional. Um, and so that's not only the first regional housing trust fund in the state, but it's also the first rural housing trust fund. And so those kind of examples give me a lot of hope that localities are um, open to experimenting, to putting money into things. Um, and incidentally, that uh, trust fund was seeded by money from Virginia Housing. So there, that is where those kind of intersections happen. Um, and here's another um, suggestion I have for you all. So, uh, Virginia Housing put out $32 million um, to each of the planning district commissions that cover, I think there's 24 or 30 of them, 20, 20 something of them around the state. They cover each um, locality in the state um, and gave each one of them affordable housing funding to then disperse as they saw fit. I would love each of you to go back to those planning district commissions now and say, um, how did that feel? How did it feel to be leading on affordable housing and to be creating regionalism around affordable housing? What do you want to do next? Because you just built out some infrastructure and developed some in-house knowledge about affordable housing, um, but you don't have um, necessarily uh, a next pot of money coming from Virginia housing to do a next round, but how can we not lose momentum? Um, so I'll leave this slide with you, but I think there are a tremendous amount of opportunities at the local level for solutions. Um, Patty Koval asked me to pitch the governor's housing conference. Um, I definitely recommend any of you find some time to attend. Um, and I think uh, I'll be sharing with you uh, through the Virginia Funders Network, um, the conference schedule and some of the sessions that I thought might be um, most useful to you. Um, and so this is just another kind of summary slide um, that I don't really need to go over. Um, so I will just end it there and um, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for all that insightful information. Um, there, I do have a question. I checked the chat and I, I don't see that there are questions, but um, I'm curious, you mentioned that one approach that you know you recommend 
um, is that there be a focus on building the capacity of organizations who are involved in housing. Um, what might that look like? What do you find are the gaps and how could resources help support that? Yeah, so I think that um, if you think about nonprofit product, housing production, um, staffs have been really challenged over the last few years with retention um, at those organizations and with burnout. And so I think at a very low cost level, it's about helping those um, organizations to um, recover from that experience and to get either the coaching or the you know, business advice about how to structure an organization that can be competitive um, with others and that can um, be supportive of the staff. Um, but I think beyond that, if you really have this uh, belief as I do that the money is coming, that the spigots are gonna open, how can the organizations that are your infrastructure in your uh, jurisdictions be best prepared to take that on. So I would love, I mean, personally, I would love to just go through an exercise that's sort of like, um, you know, one of those like emergency management, FEMA kind of exercises, like, all right, it's go time. <laughs> they just announced $60 million of a new tax credit program. Like, what am I gonna do? What does my organization need to have in place to be able to take full advantage of that? And so um, I think helping uh, organizations think through that and plan how they would scale. Thank you, Erica. And we do have a question in the chat um, and that I'll read. It says, when you assess access to housing, do you take into account terrain? Mountainous rural areas of Virginia have limited access to buildable land. An exception is abandoned surface mining sites that are now being used for economic development. Is it feasible to advocate for a policy to help rural communities build housing on these sites? Yeah, uh, you know, rural housing has um, so many unique constraints. Another one, in addition to the topography, is uh, water and sewer, um, that ideally you want to be um, within a small town that has municipal water and sewer if you're going to be building affordable housing, but you often don't have that luxury. I mean, that really speaks again to working with localities to get them to a place where they can um, be open to um, transferring properties that have that those um, assets to them uh, with them or um, to, to helping with zoning um, and to changing density on properties to allow that. Um, but yes, I think um, there are immutable co and extra costs to build housing in many different places that we have we will have to overcome with funding um, we have housing need as many of those slides showed in every locality and so that means even the hilly ones or even the ones that are on um, uh, well and septic so we are going to have to overcome those infrastructure costs and there's going to have to be funding um, in order to um, accommodate those well, thank you, Erica. Um, I wish we had more time, but we might have more time at the end for questions. Um, but I am going to transition to our um, next speakers, Sherry Norquist of Centera Healthcare and Dan Lehman of the Community Foundation of Central Blue Ridge. Hi, Sherry. So I will pass it on to you, Sherry. Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you for having us today. I think, uh, Monique, that um, we're going to talk through um, some questions that we thought would be helpful, and Dan is actually going to go first and talk okay. a little bit this afternoon about why we would be interested in housing um, as funders and, and from my perspective as a healthcare institution. And then um, we're going to go through a couple of other points that might interest you. So, Dan, do you want to okay. take it from here? Sure, Sherry. Thank you. And th this won't come as any surprise. Our, our community is experiencing the same post-pandemic predicament that we're hearing about all across the country. Our homelessness statistics have, are not returning to their lower pre-pandemic levels. 
uh, pre-existing rental stock that was previously available to community members with housing vouchers or eligible for permanently supportive housing has evaporated. Uh, essentially, uh, new constructed rental stock um, is in high demand, and this is going to be somewhat unique to our community. It's in high demand from professionals living in neighboring communities um, where the cost of living is much higher, and so they're attracted to uh, uh, per, uh, living in our community, that's been driving up the prices of everything else within our community. And then um, new homes that are being constructed for purchase um, are almost entirely at uh, being produced at the mar at market rate, which isn't really affordable to about half of our region's population, including much of the workforce needed by our largest employers and prospective employers who are now prioritizing housing when they're searching for new, new sites. Um, and, and so for all of those reasons, um, we want to be focusing our time and attention and our resources on housing. We also see this as an issue that bridges social welfare and economic development. So we feel that the timing is right to rally all the sectors around this particular community issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for that over overview. Um, and I know that we're going to kind of engage in the Q and A, but I did want to give Sherry an opportunity just to, you know, provide some perspective about why Centera is at the table um, and just where you all are in your journey when it comes to this work. Okay, great. So, good afternoon again. Thank you, Monique. Um, Centera, um, you know, when we took uh, look at what things were impacting people's health, um, it really does come down to the neighborhood level. And if if you don't remember anything else, then, then this statement, where you live should not determine how long you live, but it does. And so if we look at zip codes just in our immediate communities in and around um, different places, we notice that Absolutely, we see these disparities existing in, in neighborhoods. And so Sintira looked at how we could come to the table, and I'll talk more about that in the Q&A, um, but just real quickly, um, uh, in full transparency, I am a registered nurse by training. And so I had an opportunity in my career to work with um, patients and their families and over and over again we would see housing and Erica said it was super wicked but I I say it's a big bodacious bodacious issue and it also spans not only the continuum of housing but it spans a continuum of time and so when I started doing this work back in 2019 and I thought about affordable housing it was you know, brought to my attention very quickly that that's a generational issue and that that was gonna be 10 to 20 years and that we had urgent issues. And so we have to be cognizant as we start looking at this work that we have here and now issues and that we have to be looking and operating across multiple time scales. And so I appreciate the slide, Monique, that you shared around the continuum of housing because not only is there a time issue there but there's a continuum issue around whether it's emergency or thermal or other types of um, supportive housing that need to be addressed so um, the the why for us is because we have seen in our early endeavors significant positive outcomes when we look at housing first mm -hmm. and so whether it's during the pandemic that we partner with a community service board and provide stable housing to unsheltered um, neighbors and they don't have to utilize emergency rooms or whether it's a partnership with Virginia Supportive Housing, we see these as positive outcomes. And I can share a little bit more about that as we get into the Q&A. So thanks for having me. Great, thank you, Sherry. So Dan and Sherry, um, this, I do have a, a few questions that I, I'll pose to the both of you. So um, you, you, Sherry, specifically talked about partners. Um, and so, um, and this is for Dane as well. So I'm just kind of curious about some of the partnerships that you have formed um, and how some of those have come to be and why engagement of partners and residents um, is important to the work that you're doing. 
want me to go first, Sherry? So uh, our primary partners are um, our, our local health care system, Augusta Health, uh, Valley Community Services Board, and the Central Shenandoah Planning District Commission. Um, and although not a formal partner in this process, I will have to say that uh, Virginia Housing and particularly Chris McNamara has been um, our, a go-to person for us. Um, he, he has been almost a de facto member of this partnership and it, extremely encouraging of our work together. Um, but I say, would say from the, the very beginning and um, the other primary partners, are our neighbors who have been living with housing insecurity have been key to how we view, how we view and proceed with this issue. Um, we chose as a community foundation several years ago to make resident engagement the, the foundation of anything that we do. Um, but specific to this particular work, we needed to see the complexities of housing insecurity through their eyes. So our, our first steps as a foundation uh, were to br bring somebody on board to, to lead community engagement and to get him out into the community with all of our community partners um, to begin, li begin um, listening and learning. And every time he would come back to the office, he would gather us around and say, you, you have to hear this story. And one story after the next was different. Uh, we learned something with each and every one of those. And we decided that this is something that we, we can leverage um, to help get our community to a better place in terms of seeing this issue and, and the need to address it and to grow the compassion that we think is going to be needed to make some of the difficult decisions to move forward. So we sent um, my colleague back out into the community with a, a, a photographer who we do a lot of work with, and they created together um, a portrait exhibit um, of community members that's been traveling throughout our community in public places. Um, and that's coupled with a, um, a, a website with statistics as well as recordings and, um, and and it's been in coffee shops and community centers and in libraries and educational institutions. Um, and so and, and that exhibit has continued to grow. And what's been amazing is when we started doing that work, um, we wanted to make sure that we were preserving everyone's dignity and their confidentiality. But one after the next, uh, community members were saying, no, I want you to give my name. I want my story told. And so we, we have this beautiful exhibit um, that has uh, been addressing one part of this work while our partners um, have been work moving forward on our first big step, which is to have a community-wide cross-sector housing summit um, where we can bring all of the community partners together beyond just our small partnership so that we can hopefully emerge from that um, having formulated um, um, how we are going to move forward together as a community. And even though we may be taking individual actions, uh, but making sure that we have a shared aspiration for what we need to be doing around housing. And I was going to just show one or two pieces from that exhibit. If Patty, if you can bring that slide up. And um, let's see. And so the exhibit is, in, we entitled it, This is Home. And if you click on that, and, ho and hopefully it will come up. <laughs> and if not, I, I can drop the website for it in, in, the, in the chat. And which which I'll do. And the last thing I'll note about that is one of the first people who we met through this process um, was a young man who got caught up in the high school to prison pipeline. Um, but when he got himself into that situation, he decided to turn his life around, completed his his sentence, came out, has held a steady job, married, has children, but for months could not get a break in housing. But, oh, there we are. And hit the back button if you could for me, Patty. And scroll down. 
right there. And uh, if you click on that picture on the right, you'll see at least part of it here. So um, Julio and his family, when we met him, was living in the downtown Howard Johnson's, paying $700 a week for housing. And you can do the math, uh, that's a nice size mortgage. And so here, here was a young family, not able to save anything. Um, and no, no landlord would give, give them a break uh, because he had to check that box that he had been convicted of a felony. Um, even, even though he ha has, uh, is just a model citizen these days. After we did this, um, uh, started his, his portrait, he got noticed that he, they finally qualified. Uh, they do now have housing um, and is e and e and even a better job now. So we, we decided that for our upcoming housing summit, to set the right tone, um, when we have all 200 people assembled, um, it's not going to be me or another talking head standing up to welcome everybody to begin the, the summit. Um, Jaleel is going to be the first person they see in here. He's going to introduce himself and a, um, and a portion of a, of a regional documentary on housing, that part of which features him. And we hope to use that to set the tone of that meeting, that the focus needs to be on people and not structures. Um, and, and we'll have Jaleel and others who we have met along this journey who are going to be at the summit working alongside with us. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and Sherry, can you also share? And I know, you know, given your background too in the healthcare field as a nurse, um, it's sure very evident that the people part of the work is very important to you. Um, so, you can you also discuss um, who some of your partners are and why resident engagement is important? Yes. So, um, Dan set this up so beautifully because. Part of this work is not traditional data and analytics. It's necessary to be combined um, with those people's stories. And so I think about from a partner perspective and from a people perspective, how do we look for those bright spots? Where is the time? Where is the place? Where is a best practice or an idea that we can elevate in the form of a story to show how critical, mission critical this, this work really is. And so, you know, we heard about building capacity for organizations. And I would say that from a partner perspective, it's it's all organizations along the time continuum and along that housing continuum. So whether you have an entry point through a homeless shelter or through wraparound services with Virginia supportive housing. Um, so I'm going to drop in the chat or Angie is uh, also just a short story of, of a community outside of Charlottesville known as Southwood. And in this community where people, and we heard this earlier, Erica mentioned, lived where there were sewage problems and where there were road issues and there was no green space, it wasn't safe for them. You'll hear the story about how they participated in really this coming out of the ashes as one of the residents said for their home ownership. And so I uh, invite you to take a peek of that. And I also uh, will say, you know, looking at from a, from the perspective of partnership, it's really a, about the people. And so healthcare institutions and probably in and around the spaces that you work are doing community health needs assessments and holding focus groups. This is part of our partnership mechanism, listening to those communities, as you heard Dan say, being present, leveraging the um, people component, if you will, the high touch of your organization to hear um, the stories and to be able to listen listen and then translate that back to potentially a board or someone who can help fund that. Um, looking at other partners such as the Health Anchor Network where they are looking at overall um, 
you know, how do we dissolve par uh, poverty as a community and making sure that this work is done strategically and that you're pulling in the various partners that you have at your disposal. Uh, we did a similar uh, display at one of our local museums on unsheltered. And so that gave the community at large an ability to hear and see things through the form of art from people who don't normally get to tell their story. So when I think about official partnerships, those are the CDFIs and the community developers. It's also um, you know, the surf community service boards. This is where the highest concentration of those with mental illness potentially are suffering from, from homelessness. And it could be a, a homeless shelter. We saw just recently by putting a clinic in one of our local homeless shelters in Norfolk, an 80% reduction in the use of um, 911 services back and forth to the hospital. So it's really not just one bite of the apple but a holistic approach to partnerships and making sure that as you're asking questions to those in the community, you're not only connecting with them, but you're also informing and educating them. And so I like to think about our partnerships as, and you know, and I, I know that from a funding perspective, it's typically transactional, but this work really requires a transformational approach to partnerships. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, now I do have uh, one last kind of um, kind of global question for both Dan and Sherry. So um, when you're thinking about uh, resources, or that's kind of what popped in my mind, uh, what new or non-traditional resources are you leveraging to advance your work? Um, and then how do if that may look different in the future? How do you envision investing in affordable housing in the future? So we'll start with Dan. So for us at, as a community foundation, we, we traditionally are not dealing much with public funds, but this initiative um, has forced us to begin to develop those chops, so to speak. So, so we have, um, uh, have wonderful support from uh, Virginia Housing, which is sponsoring our housing summit. Um, the Virginia Department of Health um, has invested heavily in our housing work, and we've been partnering with the city of Stanton um, and some funds that uh, they have from community development block grants, and they look forward to partnering with us on future ones um, as well. Hopefully that is at least get building the foundation for, as, as Erica noted, being, being organizationally ready when those spigots open up in the future when there is more more public uh, funding available and we'll have the mechanisms and the people and partnerships in place to make, make good use of those. Along with that, uh, we've been fortunate that we were developing a, um, a seven figure um, board directed fund of unrestricted monies uh, that, that's gonna be our, our dry tender, so to speak, uh, for when, when some investment opportunities come along. And I've been steadily warming my my board up for using our investment assets differently. So moving moving um, as, as a mid-sized community foundation into the realm of impact investing so that we can go way beyond, hopefully, um, our traditional grants and, and the magnitude of those to uh, do some, uh, some much more um, grander um, um, disbursements um, in, in a way that will have um, uh, have a, a return on those investments, both financially and socially. Thank you, Dan. Sherry? So I, I think we've said this, and I'll leave you um, with this, that there is definitely power in being present. So um, building up those uh, community development organizations, I think you asked what's a an example of a way that we um, work with agencies. We have uh, an urban league here locally, and they have started doing um, education on home ownership. I would say that's pretty non 
traditional, but being able to know about those services and being able to connect with agencies such as Virginia Housing and such as Housing Forward, these things um, make us smarter, but also allow us to pass that wisdom on to our partners and allows us to give that what I would traditionally say for a large organization, which is seen as power, when you pass on information, you're really leveraging your power, but removing it at that community level and that grassroots level. So capacity building, looking at public and private partnerships, um, convening, you know, making available um, conferences to some partners that might not be able to go smaller 501 um, partners. And then really um, looking at agencies and partners who do this work, who have a skill, and then trusting them to do that work really well. So moving at the speed of trust, if you will. And um, and sometimes it takes a small investment to open the door to really be able to peep inside what those organizations are doing and learning from them um, what is working and what is not so that you can move that best practice um, from place to place and share that knowledge across the state of Virginia. So I think I answered both of your questions. Um, feel free to yep. re-ask if I didn't quite cover the other one. You definitely did. Thank you, Sherry. So with that, I think that Sherry and Dan's comments set us up really well for the next section of our session, which are the breakout rooms. Um, so we are a little... All right. So um, again, we are at the end of this session. Um, as a sponsor, I'd like to thank VFN for the partnership with Virginia Housing um, and really hope that this is the first of many sessions that will help elevate awareness about the needs for affordable housing and how funders can continue to support that work. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to the CEO of VFN, um, Bess Littlefield. Yeah. I've got to unmute myself. Thank you, Andy. Um, I am sure that your small group discussions were as engaging as the one that I participated in. And I want to thank everyone. This has been a fabulous, fabulous session. So much to learn. And thank all of the presenters and Monique for your wonderful um, uh, moderation of this panel. I'm, we're going to be closing this out, but I am my my last request to you all is as we as we close this out, there'll be a survey, an evaluation survey for this session, and we really would appreciate your spending just a few minutes um, to let us know uh, how how you felt about this, what takeaways um, were important, so that we can continue to improve these learning opportunities for our members. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.